Good afternoon and welcome to all of you to today's online seminar debate organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance on the topic bank boards and supervisory expectations. My name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at the Bocconi University and I'm also a board member of a non-executive director of Unicredit. I will be chairing the debate today and would very much like to start by welcoming and introducing briefing our speakers. We have Elizabeth McCall, member of the supervisory board of the European Central Bank, with a long experience in supervision after starting her career at Goldman Sachs, particularly in the areas of supervisory strategy, internal governance, and the consistent equality across the single supervisory mechanism. And then we have Lorenzo Benismaghi, who is a chairman of Societa Generale now, with a long experience, first in the public sector, with important positions at the Bank of Italy, the Treasury, and the European Central Bank, and then in the private sector as a member of board of numerous financial and non-financial companies, and ultimately mm. at the Societa Generale. So it's funny that you sort of uh, have uh, the opposite experience. Elizabeth first in the private and then public, and Lorenzo the other way. Mm. So thank you very much to both of you for joining us today. We are really grateful that you have the possibility to talk to us in this seminar. So before giving the floor to you, let me briefly explain the background for today's seminar. So those of you that follow the seminar of the school may have noticed that the title and the topic is a bit different from our usual seminars. So today's event launches a new initiative, a new seminar series for the meta called Challenges for Bank Board Members which will lead up to the first training activity for board members in this new initiative called Bank Board Academy for Non-Executive Directors, which will start as a training in June 2021. So the seminar series will entail an online seminars per month. The next will be on December 17 on the topic Governance and Control Lessons from Wirecard, and will feature as a speaker James Fraze, who is the former CEO of Wirecard the very last one, that, the one that dealt with the, the problem in the wildcard. The link of the registration will be published, so in case you are interested in that, you can directly sign up for it. And more information on the overall um, FBF Bank Board Academy is available at the webpage of the school. But let me say the overall goal, and the seminar today is an example of this, is to build a community of board members that can interact with each other and also with the authorities to discuss openly and share best practices. So let, now, without further ado, let me turn to the organization of today's seminar, given that we have an hour and we are very eager to debate the topic. We will have Elizabeth uh, that will give initial remarks for 10, 15 minutes, and then we will have Lorenzo that will comment on these remarks. And then I very welcome, and I mean, I very, I very much invite all of you that participate, as usual, to ask a question in our Q&A uh, chat and you can clearly all of you are clearly invited to do this but in this particular case I strongly encourage the board members that are connected with us and we know that we have several board members to start trying to, to start this community so to really start interacting given that we have the possibility and with that let me give the floor to Elizabeth for their remarks and thanks again to both of you for being with us today. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's an honor for me to be here today. I know that you honored a mentor of mine, Tommaso Pados Chiopa, so it's of particular importance for me to be here. Um, thank you. Um, I really welcome uh, your, your initiative to bring together professionals from the financial industry to exchange views on the challenges that bank boards are facing and to talk about how they can effectively oversee the management of banks, which is very important. It's one of the main priorities of the ECB banking supervision too, that there be good governance, sound governance in your area banks. So today I will talk about some of the most pressing governance issues, including in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. I'll also present some of our supervisory expectations of bank boards and board members in ensuring good governance and resilience in the banks. It's rather fitting that we're considering the issue of good governance in Florence the home of the great Medici family, the first to use double entry bookkeeping and letters of credit on a large scale. The Medici's must have been 
must have had very strong arrangements in place to ensure that they retained ultimate control over activities across the many branches they held all around Europe by the end of the 15th century from Venice to London via Geneva, Barcelona, and many other European cities. As the Medicis must have realized, good governance and effective controls are key to responsible decision-making and they became all the more important in times of crisis, like the one we've been experiencing since the pandemic broke out in March. Governance has been one of the key areas of the supervisory focus since ECB banking supervision was first set up. A bank's resilience and its likelihood to withstand a crisis are ultimately determined by checks and balances at all levels, together with a clear organizational structure, well-defined lines of responsibility, and effective risk management practices. Undeniable progress has been made in Europe since 2015 with regard to bank governance, with ECB banking supervision raising the bar in terms of what's expected of bank boards, supervisory committees, and internal control frameworks, and the policies, just to name a couple of examples. And yet, there is still plenty of room for improvement in governance at Euro area banks. Indeed, our supervisory recommendations in last year's supervisory cycle mainly concern governance issues. And the current COVID-19 environment is making it all the more important for banks to address some of these shortcomings as they can seriously compromise overall resilience. I'd like to give you a few examples. First, risk aggregation uh, of data is still deficient in many banks and the accuracy and timeliness of internal reporting needs to be enhanced. Naturally, this is a deficiency that limits a management body's capacity to take the right strategic decisions and it hampers the holistic monitoring of material risks, which is essential to get right in the current circumstances. Ideally, management bodies should not only focus on the material aspects of the pandemic, but they also need to be able to recognize the nuances and the challenges that they're facing so they can adjust their strategy when they need to. And to do that, they need to have access to risk aggregation data that incorporates just exactly the insights that they would get from the data. So for example, management bodies should have a clear overview of the credit risk data and whether the tools and the methods used are fit for purpose. They should ensure that management is making appropriate adjustments to reflect the effects of the pandemic. Flexibility in reprioritizing projects and optimizing working from home and digital opportunities are other examples of best practices. Second, we're observing how in some banks, control functions have been insufficiently proactive in adapting to COVID-19. This environment needs revising of risk appetite frameworks to align them with strategic goals or in making their decision-making processes all the more agile. Particularly in times of crisis, the board of directors needs to effectively challenge the functioning, the work plans, the priorities of the control functions to ensure that they're adequately fulfilling the bank's risk management, measurement and monitoring responsibilities. An effective board of directors requires strong support structures and should be able to demonstrate evidence of independent oversight of the control functions. That's risk, compliance, AML, internal audit. And to do so, the board needs to have full and direct access to the heads of these control functions. In other words, the interaction between the board and the heads of risk, compliance, AML, and internal audit shouldn't be filtered through an interposed level of executive management. And likewise, internal control heads should report regularly to the board and to the, reg and to the relevant committees. Board reporting needs to be supported by agile internal systems capable of producing reliable information, thus fostering meaningful discussion and effective decision-making processes. So in this context, it might be necessary to overhaul legacy IT systems and integrate bank subsidiary systems and head office infrastructure to strengthen the support structure and to eliminate gaps or the possibility of having inaccurate information. And finally, effective boards should have access to independent research and the right to initiate such research even outside of the bank's regular channels. Depending on the size and the structure of the bank, we've seen some cases where a dedicated and well-staffed secretariat or a governance function is augmenting the power of the board to challenge. And in other cases, an internal function that oversees the most pressing priorities within the bank's organizational structure can significantly improve the strategic ability of boards to steer. I'm thinking here, 
course, being uh, with you in Italy of organizzazione and the power of organizzazione. Next, I would like to turn my attention to effective challenge processes. As supervisors, we expect non-executive directors to constructively challenge executive directors. We sometimes hear non-executive directors express concerns of two varieties. First, that the supervisor expects directors to provide so much oversight that it makes it look as though the directors are regularly stepping into management roles. And second, that management sometimes characterizes directors' efforts to understand and steer as blurring those separate roles of management and directors and this results sometimes in management resisting them. So these, if we think about it, these are two sides of the same coin and context provides the backdrop for responding to these concerns. In every context, we expect non-executive directors to serve as a compass for the bank, providing strong, constant direction in both calm and rough waters by ensuring independent oversight of management proposals and decisions. In normal times, such oversight mitigates financial and reputational risks. This requires board members to be given adequate insight into detailed information. And in times of stress or crisis, effective non-executive directors, especially those that are in key board positions, such as the lead independent director, members of risk and audit committees, are often called upon to provide even more intensive steering of the ship. In the COVID-19 environment, this translates into strong oversight to avoid credit risk opacity and to deliver clarity on the trajectory of capital resulting from macroeconomic developments. It also means thinking about strategic plans regarding the best positioning for the bank in the context of the landscape as a whole. This entails providing strategic direction in navigating the consequences of the lockdowns for the economy together with the associated impact on borrower creditworthiness, balance sheets, capital, operations in the face of the restrictions. And consolidation is one area that would allow banks to strengthen their, their positioning. So to live up to the task of navigating, the board as a whole must have the right expertise and diversity of experience. I recall here that the Medici success was based on diversification from more than just size, and it was very different from earlier Italian banks. Board members need to have the gift of versatility, it should not be comprised only of experts from similar backgrounds broadening perspectives and crafting outcomes that might not be imagined if groupthink takes over, comes from drawing on a myriad of backgrounds and experiences. Often persons with high ethics and common sense are the most valuable directors, and they may not solely be those with other typical bank board member backgrounds. Gender diversity is important too. It brings different valuable dynamics into the boardroom. And in these days, the pandemic has driven technology and digitalization to the fore, no doubt about that. Space needs to be made for members who understand both the opportunities and the risk that this creates. ECB banking supervision conducts the final quality control over the appointment of board members. We work closely with national banking supervisors to ensure that board members comply with minimum quality standards. In 2021, ECB will implement a stricter and a more intrusive approach to fit and proper assessments. The board and its individual members need to internalize their responsibility. This means also their legal responsibility. We will closely scrutinize matters that may impor, impair a board member's suitability, such as previous criminal convictions, um, ongoing legal proceedings. We also intend to examine the individual accountability of board members more closely. Directors who are guilty of misconduct or who turn a blind eye to misconduct by their peers should not be able to hide behind the collective responsibility of the board. And finally, we also plan to pay closer attention to reassessments during ongoing supervision, particularly when the emergence of new facts raises material concerns about the suitability of existing bank directors. In 2021, we'll publish a revised guide on fit and proper assessments clarifying our expectations on the suitability of bank directors. This guide allows for closer scrutiny of, scrutiny of the individual accountability of board members. It will also clarify when and how the emergence of new material facts might result in the ECB reassessing bank directors. We're also making fit and proper processes more efficient by setting up an online portal where applications for prospective directors can be submitted. Banks will be encouraged to submit their applications 
before individuals take up their positions, which will enable us to front load our assessment of candidates. And the ECB has also created a dedicated fit and proper department and an enforcement and sanctionings committee to streamline this process further. But while the aim is for rigorous fit and proper criteria to be applied equally across all the euro area banks, unfortunately, we have to recognize that the implementation of these criteria is not currently harmonized across all euro countries. The EU legal framework applicable to fit and proper assessments still fragmented, reflecting various implementation of the CRD across member states. Diver diverging national standards should not undermine supervisory efforts though to pursue stronger governance structures in the supervised banks. We need fully harmonized fit and proper criteria and increased clarity on the fit and proper process in order to ensure a level playing field. And ideally this would come from a directly applicable EU regulation. In times of crisis, the role played by boards becomes all the more important. They need to be attuned to the possibilities of the future. They need to be aware of the risks of the present. And through it all, they have to carry out effective oversight of the management function. And they must ensure that strong control functions and a sound risk appetite framework are in place at all times, but all the more so during a crisis where good governance can mean the difference between a bank that merely wobbles and a bank that ultimately collapses. After all, it was precisely a lack of strong control over the strategic direction of their banking empire that led to the decline and the fall of the Medici themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. You touch a lot of uh, topics that I'm sure we will come back to. Let me just say that we are actually planning a, a seminar on the new fit and proper of the ECB in the next February. So we are already in contact with the new head of department of the fit and proper. So we will have a full discussion on the new okay. criteria. And for that, let me give now the floor to Lorenzo, please. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me um, uh, to participate to this uh, discussion, which um, I hope is the beginning of a, of a dialogue. Um, <clears throat> as, as, as um, I, I think it's important to understand and to assess how certain rules in principles are defined and supposed to be implemented and how they are implemented uh, on, on the ground and, and whether the way in which they're implemented um, may be improved uh, <clears throat> or, or the way in which they're implemented suggests that maybe uh, some of the rules uh, would need to be to be to be adjusted, um, I think um, just as a as a, <clears throat> to mention a few observations. Indeed, uh, since the creation of the SSM, uh, major changes uh, have taken place in Europe, and um, it has been a huge uh, a huge endeavor, and um, and and boards have um, have had to uh, to do their their own tasks. Uh, also in uh, adapting to the new uh, procedures. I mean, um, uh, banks were mainly used to interact with the national supervisors. Uh, then they uh, uh, moved to interact with the European supervisors. Um, and <clears throat> so the effort uh, of adjustment has been, uh, has been huge. Uh, and I think it's uh, to the benefit of the whole banking system if now we have uh, uh, rules and procedure which are harmonized throughout uh, the continent. But uh, this has entailed a lot of work uh, uh, over the past few years. And uh, we see in these first uh, few uh, months of the uh, biggest crisis, I guess, uh, since uh, 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 over the last century, that uh, the work which has been done uh, has been useful because uh, the resilience of the banking system, so far at least, shows that um, that this work has 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 been quite quite good. Um, I, I I think that uh, as I said, I hope that this is is also a dialogue because it's useful. Uh, it I think it could be useful for the supervisor to get some feedback, uh, direct feedback, incidentally, uh, rather than indirect through the regular. Uh, uh, interaction that supervisors have with the banks that 
often goes uh, through the regular procedures, uh, uh, through management, through the bureaucratic uh, reportings. Uh, so maybe a more direct dialogue and informal dialogue is useful to, to understand what can be improved on both sides and, and how things uh, work. Because there is a governance of banks, but there is a governance of the relationship between banks and, and supervisors. Um, uh, for instance, the ECB has installed the, uh, the tradition, I would say, uh, to attend once a year a board uh, meeting, which uh, used to be the case, uh, actually more regular in some national tradition. In other traditions, it, it, uh, it was not the case. Um, now the uh, the standard has been once, once, uh, once a year, but it, it is at a technical level. It's not a board member from the SSM which attends. It is, uh, it is somebody who, um, who is uh, coming uh, at, a, I would say at a technical level, uh, which of course addresses technical issues, uh, which sometimes are not, uh, I mean, are, are part of the regular uh, 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 interaction rather than addressing really strategic issues, as would be the case uh, if we had a, a higher level of, uh, of a dialogue. And then also, the real, <clears throat> I think it's important to, to have a good governance of uh, supervision, uh, looking at banks from the managerial side, uh, from the uh, executive director side, and also from the non-executive director side. And uh, I think it's important to to make sure that all the aspects relay, uh, interrelates in an appropriate way. And um, one of the issues that um, I have raised with you and, and I think would be a, an issue to, to, of, of a dialogue is, is to make sure that we don't blur the lines between executive and non-executive. And we allow non-executive in particular to do their job properly and maintain their independence and be able to do the kind of things that you mentioned, uh, Elizabeth, while remaining independent. And <clears throat> there is, uh, I think, uh, when we move from the theory to the practice, there is a point in which if you get too much into the day-to-day, -day, you don't become independent anymore. And, uh, and you become part of the, implicitly, you become part of the executive uh, 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 element. And, this, this, in my view, has to be better examined. In my view, it depends a lot on when you move from the strategic uh, uh, issues to the details. And the more you get into the details, uh, the more, uh, and especially if you don't have the time to dedicate, and you cannot have the time if you're a director, uh, unless you become a, a, a member of the, of, of the management team, uh, the more you get into the details, the more you lose your independence uh, and you're, you're asked to ratify things that you cannot really uh, have a full mastery of, uh, of, of the decision. So um, <clears throat> I think w w when you come to the supervisory expectations for, for the board in general, they cannot be of the same level of detail as for the management. And uh, while, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the board has to uh, make sure that the management has to implement uh, uh, the right decisions. And there are many areas where we can look at uh, um, the, uh, the border, uh, the, the, the line between uh, executive and, and non-executive director and how to, to better attune uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, the, the supervisory expectations. Another area which I think from a non-executive board that would be interesting to, to discuss, um, you mentioned at a certain point, uh, well, consolidation could be a way to address some of the... Well, I think <clears throat> sometimes the impression that boards have is that um, uh, supervisors don't have a holistic view of the... Um, framework in which banks operate, framework in the sense of overall regulatory framework. Um, if I think about, for instance, uh, the ability to participate in a consolidation and the ability to generate uh, uh, synergies and in the end to be profitable and to uh, remunerate capital, one has to look not only 
at the specific events or at the supervisory framework only, but at a whole range of uh, factors that affect uh, uh, banks' activities, uh, which are partly linked to, to what the supervisor or the institutions uh, do. For instance, and I just list a few things, we live in a world in Europe, which is different from the one in the US, for instance, where there are negative interest rates. We live in a world in which in the worst financial crisis, banks are taxed to the SRF with a higher amount. I think it's the only sector in the, in the, in, 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 uh, in, in the economic uh, activity where taxes have been risen, have been increased because of the, what is the reason? Because the balance sheet of banks are going up because of the ECB's intervention. It, it's, it's, it's frankly, it's crazy uh, <laughs> to, to just to be, to be blunt. Um, we live in an environment in which, of course, we have capital uh, labor markets uh, that we have in Europe. The capital markets is different from other parts. So I think there are many elements that sometimes we have the impression that um, each uh, institution is looking at, at its own um, uh, activities without having an overall uh, approach that would be useful to discuss, I think, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, for, 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 to, to have a better understanding of why banks behave in a certain way rather than, than in another one. So I don't want to be too long. Maybe I should, I should close by saying that um, um, I, I think uh, we have been doing in, in Europe a, a good job and, and banks uh, have certainly improved if you compare to the pre, uh, uh, to the pre -fin great financial crisis uh, situation. The exercise of integrating uh, the banking systems of uh, of 18 or 19 countries has been huge. And I think we have contributed to, the, to, to that uh, uh, as also as boards. Uh, there is a lot of work to do also because we are facing a huge crisis. But I think it's important to, to look at this crisis also as an opportunity to try to, uh, uh, to provide banks, which are the core of the financial system in Europe, because Europe is still a bank-centric uh, system, to make sure that this, uh, Bancocentric system is providing uh, services to the real economy, is uh, continuing to support the real economy, and is not penalized uh, uh, in the in, in doing this by by a series of constraints that uh, ultimately run counter uh, the desire of the, poli the the policy authorities, which is to to have a, a strong real economy, not only a strong and stable financial system. So I hope that this uh, would be uh, the basis for this dialogue uh, that, uh, that we will have with supervisors and others uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Before opening the floor for questions, and I again encourage participants to type the questions in the Q&A. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I, I thought uh, I couldn't hear anything anymore. Okay, so before I do it, let me give the floor back to Elizabeth if you want to make comment. One aspect that I think Lorenzo raised and you also raised before, which is a semi somehow at the core of the discussion today, is this link between the non-executive directors and the management. To which extent you said is a two-sided pro is a two-sided problem because on the one hand, the non-executive directors don't want to be too much into the management. If they get too much into the management, the management retreats. So where is the balance? And I don't know if you could also make some examples that would help us in understanding better where the border could be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think you made um, three main points, and I think they're all um, extremely important, particularly at this moment. And the first one um, about the blurring the lines between um, the management and the boards. Look, this is a, it's an art, not a science. Um, and it's, uh, I, I, know, I know many, many board members and many senior managers. And I mean, probably the most important thing is that there's, um, that there's a healthy relationship between the two because it doesn't work if there's not a healthy relationship between the two. Um, and that's very, uh, very case by case. Um, but let's presume for my answer that there's a healthy relationship between the management and the senior management, uh, between the, the management body and the senior management. When there is a, there's a, I think a very uh, different um, uh, tenor 
to how you calibrate this um, in situations where there is a crisis taking place or there's been a, um, a paradigm shift of some sort that changes the risk dynamics of the bank. And when the risk dynamics of the bank change, there is an incredible need for the board members to have, I'm going to say, detailed curated uh, information because you know burying board members in the details of the business when they're not um, running as as Lorenzo properly says uh, they're not uh, capable of they're not in the day to day decision making so there's risk there that if you start asking them with too much information to make uh, daily day to day decisions about the running of a business you can have uh, an enormous um, uh, risk event that occurs just from that itself. So uh, the idea is certainly not that uh, board members are in the day-to-day -day decision making. And it's not the case that we expect board members to get such detailed information that they're paralyzed from making decisions because there's an overabundance of information and they can't cut through to understand what the overall picture is. Um, but in a time of crisis, in a time of a risk event, um, board members have to be much more intrusive and they have to push to get information uh, that um, they might not normally be receiving. They need to recognize that they're in a different situation and that um, there might be very big shifts that the bank needs to be making in order to stay ahead of the risk, emerging risk that's occurring. I'm thinking of credit risk right now, right now in Europe. Um, and it's not the case that you would normally have a board um, extremely involved in what the reclassifications are, what the staging process is, what, um, how you're dealing with forbearance and how you are uh, looking at um, whether or not there's been a significant increase in credit risk. Um, but the situation is changing and many banks right now, the systems are um, not calibrated for the current situation where there's been so much public support. So board members need to understand this better and they need to understand whether they have correct line of sight into uh, what's happening with, uh, with the credit, uh, the, with the credit uh, book in a way that they didn't have to, um, have to look at before. So um, I have great sympathy for this point about the blurring of the lines. Um, we're not looking for board members to be micromanagers, uh, to be very clear. Uh, but we are looking for them to step up their game when the situation requires it and to be much more involved. And we are expecting senior managers to expect also that. So um, just to hit on that point for a moment. On the consolidation point, um, and also on your second, your, your third point about um, the holistic uh, landscape within which banks are operating, I think these are quite linked. Um, uh, and I think you're quite right to point out that it's very important that um, the various players in crafting and honing the policy understand what the policy transmission mechanisms are and uh, work in some harmony to make sure that, um, you know, in the case of banking, that the policy transition mechanism to deliver uh, uh, the ability of the banks to be the channel for lending to the real economy is, um, is appropriately supported. And it's complicated. It's complicated in the US, it's complicated in Europe because you have correctly uh, different institutional bodies with different uh, raison d'etre, different missions, different uh, aspects of the economy that they're responsible for. I, I uh, you know, I'm new to the ECB. It's, um, I'm coming up on my one year anniversary, I, I think today, might be it actually. I'm one year at the ECB today. And um, so I, I consider myself more- You're still alive and you're still alive. <laughs> and I'm still alive. <laughs> I've been a spectator really and, and an admiring one. What has happened through this year, it's been nothing short of extraordinary. The way the institutions have actually worked together, it's, it's extraordinary to see it. Um, we don't have a financial crisis and that's, that's a, a testament um, I, I praise all of the public officials that have been responsible for putting that together and the bankers um, for working very much uh, together in that process. And I'm looking forward to that happening in 2021 as well. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me go to Lorenzo now for a question. So you mentioned this holistic approach and the fact, and you mentioned this tax that the banks had to pay to the, to the SRF. But on the other hand, supervisors gave banks the possibility to use some of the capital and liquidity buffers that had accumulated. And in some way, banks did not make much use of that, at least if we look at the data. So the question is, do you think that somehow the board gave a priority to shareholder over supervisory expectation because supervisory were expecting banks to do that to support better the economy? What's your view on this? Are you asking uh, Elizabeth or? No, no, you. Me? <laughs> the question was for you. And then maybe we go to ask her, oh. but the question was directed to you. No, I mean, this is the big, the big contradiction, I think, um, that, that I can understand from a policymaker having been in, in that world. I think what, what, what policymakers and supervisors would like now is banks to have enough capital to absorb the shock, but on the other hand, to use part of the capital to support the economy. And there is some contradiction, inevitably, uh, between these, these two objectives, and, and, I can, and I can understand both. But... It's very difficult to achieve to achieve both. Um, let me explain why uh, banks are not using a, a, a part of the capital uh, to 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 really do even more. Uh, I think what um, what sometimes um, supervisors, I mean, we uh, in, in boards that have to deal with in the end shareholders shareholders because we represent the interest of shareholders. We have the impression, let me say it uh, mildly, that, that supervisors think that, that shareholders are kind of charity uh, in the sense that, you know, they put their capital there and uh, they are forced to do it some, some, somehow, like if they have no, no real alternative. And, and, and furthermore, they are stopped uh, at, you know, at uh, Modigliani Miller, if I can say so. That the shareholders doesn't really care if uh, if uh, dividends are are piled up in capital, uh, as as we could derive from you know uh, theory sixty years ago. Well, and, and to some extent, I would think that in this dialogue that we are having and that the the school is developing, it would be good to have some shareholders. Uh, um, and you know, what do shareholders? What do investors think? And first, what we feel is that first, investors are not obliged to, uh, to invest in banks. They can move away and invest in technology, pharmaceutical, and so on. Uh, second, I mean, they don't want to be penalized and would want to, to have certainty. If they don't have certainty about the future, then the cost of capital goes up. And what are the elements that today uh, create uncertainty? First is when the supervisor invites to use the capital buffers, how long will it, will it take to go back to restore the buffers after the crisis? And of course, it's a very difficult question to answer. But the fear, the fear, uh, and when we look at how Basel has been interpreted and so on and so forth, is that banks will, might be required to re reconstitute the capital buffers much more quickly than expected. So that's the first uncertainty. And of course, the second uncertainty is about, is about dividends. Um, uh, if, if I am an investor, like even a charity, actually, if I'm an Italian foundation uh, and I need to, to, you know, to, 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 to help uh, hospitals in my regions uh, or, 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 a, or art or and so forth, or if I am a, 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 an insurance company, I need to, 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 the, to, to pay out uh, uh, to my uh, to my subscribers um, to my fund subscribers, I need to have some certainty about about that. Otherwise, I move to another sector. I move to the technology, to pharmaceutical, uh, which do not have this uncertainty. So, I'm not saying that this is an easy an easy issue, but these are are elements that need to be taken into account if we want the financial sector to be attractive for investors which is a key condition for the financial, for the banking system to be, to be strong in Europe. 
Thank you. I don't know if Elizabeth wants to comment on it, but before giving the floor back to you, let me also add another question that is instead more again on governance. So some people ask um, whether you have a, a sort of view on which governance structure between having a dualistic board between auditors and board members or having a monolistic approach. If you have any idea of which one may perform better than another or what are the pros and cons of one versus the other. And then of course, if you feel free to also comment on Lorenzo, reply. Yeah, um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen the question. Uh, I start with the question first. Um, um, and it seems to be very focused on um, the, the College of Auditors. It's the, the surveillance, the uh, Organizzazione Surveillance, the Surveillance Board. Um, I think that's very particular under Italian law and that it certainly serves a purpose. So I don't uh, want to comment on the um, value or lack of value of it. Um, um, but as a general, you know, a broad, more broad question, a dualist system, um, you know, I think a strong board has to have a mix of independent members. Um, it, it should have uh, some seats at that table that belong to uh, some board, uh, internal board people, especially, um, you know, the, 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 the seats, the seats that are, um, the seats that are really responsible for running some of the businesses should have some connection that's very strong with the board, whether that's set up as a separate um, management board um, and that reports into the supervisory board. I think that's a, that's a, a, a very good framework. Um, making sure that there's a supervisory board though that can penetrate uh, the, management, uh, the management board and, and the decision-making there, um, that's probably the, the key component of it. Um, as for some of Lorenzo's, um, you know, important points, I mean, these are, these are really critical points. I mean, we want the capital, and your question, Elena, we want the, the, um, the capital buffers to be used because we want, uh, we want the, con the, the lending to continue to the real economy. We're looking for banks to be differentiating amongst uh, vulnerable credits and uh, the credits that are likely to be um, strong as soon as this uh, dampening of the economy ends that's been caused by the pandemic. Um, and if banks need to use their buffers in order to make though that lending to the real economy available, um, we have made that flexibility, um, I hope very clear that um, they're, they're available to be used and that, um, and Lorenzo raises the point about certainty of when uh, they will need to be replenished. Um, we have said that we will not be requiring uh, the replenishment to occur in any um, short term uh, frame, but you know, probably the point is well taken. What does that mean? And what does it mean to different authorities? So um, I take that back to think about because if that's an impediment, it's something that we should really uh, look to make more, more clarity about. Um, as for shareholders um, and uh, the connection point there, um, on the capital levels, et cetera. Um, shareholders certainly are not charity, um, but we have to think about it in a very important context. Um, shareholders have also been quite the beneficiaries of uh, these very extraordinary public policy measures that have taken place. Um, and they know that and they're there um, because there's been that support. We're not in a financial crisis. We're in a situation where there have been um, uh, extreme support to, uh, to uh, the entire economy overall. So, um, uh, and this is to everyone's benefit. Um, so it's important to recognize that component. Um, and it's also the case that the banks have been beneficiaries of the asset purchase programs and liquidity. And uh, we need to do that. We need to continue doing that uh, as long as it's needed. Um, so, you know, there's, it's a complicated question about um, uh, what happens. Uh, the bottom line is banks need to have very strong balance sheets. Uh, we're entering a period of time over the next several months that uh, there's every expectation, even though there's tremendous um, hope and optimism and good reason for it with the vaccine and the news of the vaccine, it's gonna take some time. And um, I think the great irony of history may be that this vaccine has becoming available and many, many people may 
contract COVID before we're able to get it from lab to arm. And so, uh, you know, the, the predictions are that we're in for a very um, uh, sad winter uh, with this uh, virus affecting many, many people over the next couple of months. Um, and this will have a concomitant uh, impact on the economy and on the banks. So we need to make sure that the banks are in strongest position possible to, to withstand that period. Thank you. Let me go back to you, um, uh, Lorenzo, for a, a question which is still connected. And then we go back more to the governance again. So you said that I just saw that the boards responded to shareholders, but clearly, as we know now, there is the growing view that boards should rather respond to larger set of stakeholders. And what's your view on this and how boards should approach that? So because there also there may be a trade off, as we know. So what do you think? Yes, if, if I can just come back to to what Elizabeth just said. Um, and, and, and I know that from the regulatory point of view, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult issue, but I, I just want to, to, to mention that many other sectors of the economy have benefited uh, from the support of the public authorities, but have not been banned from distributing dividends. And of course, everybody's prudent. What I mentioned is that the banking sector is the only one, and, and Eurozone is the only area uh, uh, where the ban is, is being implemented. So the only issue that I want to raise is that we all have to be prudent, even in our dividend policy. But when you are stigmatized as, you know, it looks like you're a bad guy. And I, I don't think this is the right message for, for the economy, for, for, for stakeholders, for shareholders, and, 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 and in general for the, for the system. Now, moving to this trade-off, shareholders versus uh, stakeholders, I think it's, it's, these are, are key issues. I think that uh, if you look at the medium term, uh, banks that have good governance, uh, that uh, address in the right way uh, stakeholders' issues like uh, uh, ESG issues, over the medium term will perform better. And uh, this is true for banks, but it's true for companies in general. So I think what is important is to first engage with the stakeholders, explain their long-term strategy, explain, uh, uh, um, for instance, what are your environmental commitments, uh, explain how this is an opportunity for the bank uh, rather than a cost, uh, how uh, you are going to, uh, to um, uh, generate uh, revenues, but also acquire leadership uh, in certain areas, like I don't want to make uh, an advertisement, but for instance, we are the largest bank uh, uh, financing uh, renewable energy. So to, if, you, if you do that, I think you can reconcile. Um, then there are some issues which are more complicated, and uh, for instance, cost cutting. And it, it's clear that banks are facing uh, very difficult times, and the, the, the regulator actually is pushing us to uh, uh, to be more cost efficient, and this involves social social uh, effects, and these these have to be managed uh, consistently with the with the local uh, uh, practices and rules, um, and and this is a is a is a, is a complicated issues for the sector as a whole in Europe because we know that uh, uh, in the end uh, we have to go through a, a more consolidated uh, sector. But aside from, from that, I would say that uh, uh, stakeholders of the medium term uh, ask the right questions for us uh, uh, for, as banks. Thank you. And let me say also from an academic perspective, there are many studies showing that there is not necessarily conflict between a shareholder and stakeholder, as long as maybe it's not excessive. But it can be, it can be somehow um, put the two together. Elizabeth, let me come to you. There is a very, I think, interesting uh, question which deviates slightly from what we have said today. And you may have read it, but let me read it again. How would you see the role of independent directors in the specific governance situation of wholly owned subsidiary banks, in which often the majority of the board seats are held by members of the parent bank? What's your view on this? Hmm. This is a different yeah. question, no? That it's a yeah, little yeah. bit outside, out of the box. Yeah, it's not a question I've given a lot of thought to. Um, 
I suppose behind the question is, do we think that there's enough independence from the subsidiary um, in the in that um, in that uh, unit? I mean, I, you know, I think it's important for the parent to have oversight and control over the subsidiaries. Absolutely, um, uh, you know, especially where um, you have a, an institution that has a, a broad international um, footprint, um, you know, it's gonna be the case that the strength of support coming from the parent organization has to be clear and visible, has to be there. And in order to do that, they need to have line of sight into what the risk is that's emerging at the subsidiary. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, a subsidiary also, uh, let's go outside of Europe, if, if we may, um, has to operate in another uh, regulatory environment. And there are, um, you know, there are responsibilities about how that unit is being run in that market that have to comport to the um, overall regulatory framework there. And I'm thinking especially about risk. And it should also be the case that that board has independent members responsible for that entity operating in that market. So to me, I think a mix is, um, is, is the appropriate answer to this. Um, I don't have a view about uh, what that mix should look like. I'd have to give it more thought. Yeah, thank you. Let me go to another uh, point to both of you. Maybe I will ask Lorenzo first. There is, Elizabeth before talk about the, I mean, the profiles that we should have in a board and in particular, the importance of having a variety of profiles in the board. And, uh, and on the other hand, also the need of having experienced people, not necessarily in the banking sector, as you said, but certainly experienced people with high ethics. Now, clearly, one thing that the banks are facing very much at the moment is digitalization and FinTech and all what comes with it. And maybe if we want to have more people expert in this field, necessarily, to some extent, we may have to resume to younger people in the board, because maybe, not necessarily, but may, maybe it's fair to say that the younger generations may be more, let's say, knowledgeable of this rather than the older generation. So you, Lorenzo, as the chairman, when you would think about the composition of your board, what would be your view on this? And you, Elizabeth, also from a supervisory perspective, maybe Lorenzo first. Well, I, I am biased uh, in the sense that uh, we have a, a, a young person, a young woman uh, expert on digital <laughs> in our board. So, uh, and we benefit a lot, um, not only on, on digital, by the way, but also on the way to approach clients, uh, uh, and the way to, to look at uh, HR also. So uh, I think diversity, is important also not only from the point of view of gender, from the point of view of expertise or nationality, but also in terms of age. I think um, bringing uh, uh, people who are uh, who look at things differently with with a with a different background, um, with a different uh, a, a skills and ability to you know to innovate. I think is very important. So. Having younger people is is something that um, uh, um, I think is is very useful, and, and I think the the supervisor should encourage. I can I can understand the resistance because you want to bring in expertise, but you also want to bring in people who ask uh, questions which are totally different from the ones that boards are used to to address. So. Um, based on my experience and and having thought about the issue, I would certainly encourage. Uh, that type of diversification. Elizabeth? No, I agree very much with, um, with Lorenzo. Um, and, it, you know, from a supervisory point of view, um, you need to look not only at individual expertise in each board member, but you need to look at the overall um, operating of the board holistically. So do you have a board that is aligned with the current present risk and business profile? And do you have a board that is aligned with what future risk may look like and also with what the strategy of the bank is? Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's extremely, every one of those seats on that at that board table is very valuable and they need to be looked at as a whole, uh, not only each individual person. So 
Um, and it, it is, uh, you know, quite obvious that we are entering a technology filled future and making sure that in the boardroom that expertise exists is, um, is, rather, is rather essential. I think it's, um, you know, we're, you have to go back 10, 20 years, depends on uh, the locations, et cetera, but it was that a board seat was an honorary position and that this was something you earned after a long career and you brought wisdom and expertise to it um, and there's value in that. But if every single one of the seats is set up in that way, um, you won't have a board that's capable of covering the depth and breadth of risk that they will face in the current environment. So, um, uh, and diversity in the boardroom, the dynamic changes with gender diversity at that table. And I think it makes for a more stable institution. Thank you. I'm conscious of the fact that we are four minutes uh, uh, to two and I know that both of you need to go. So let me just ask a very final words. Digitalization, which is sort of connected, leads to also cybersecurity risk and the cyber risk in general. So, Lorenzo, how does the board approach this new risk? Well, I think this is one of the issues where I, I share the, the supervisor's concern uh, of having board members really involved in, in these issues. Uh, and um, this means that uh, you need to, to have um, special um, sessions, uh, even on board, uh, to understand first, I mean, who, who you are, we are facing, who, who are the, the criminals, and how these are changing, and, 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 and also find ways to, to bring in questions that are raised to the management, eventually even external expertise, um, and then monitor. I mean, I, I, uh, we decided, for instance, in our bank to, to, to ask the risk committee to have a regular monitoring of, of this, to make sure that um, we also have internal accountability um, uh, for, for the problems that may, that may arise. I think um, in, in the end, my impression is that banks have uh, uh, looked at the issue uh, earlier than other sectors. And it's important they continue to be leaders in that in that area because the the whole confidence of clients is based on uh, on you know the ability to protect their data. So I, I would say that this is one of the key issues. Incidentally, this is one of the key issues that investors uh, are looking at. I mean, in, in my roadshows, uh, investors are asking issues uh, about cybersecurity. As, as key because, of course, the reputation of a bank is based uh, on, on this. Final word to Elizabeth. In this area of cybersecurity, do you think there is scope for a change in governance in the following sense? Typically, risk management is within the risk management area. But of course, the risk management is not really expert of cybersecurity. So how do you see internally in the bank, where should the cybersecurity fit somehow in the governance of controls, if you want? Some of the best practices I've seen in this area um, separate the, the cybersecurity risk from both the technology area and the risk area. And uh, that seems to work quite well for institutions because it, it provides a challenge. It, it's, a, it's in some ways it's um, structurally needs to be somewhat similar to AML in my mind, where you have a really particular expertise uh, that's set up there. Um, and just to add to Lorenzo's point, um, I also think that uh, this, this is a top of mind risk for institutions. At the European level, um, also like AML, uh, we need to be um, making sure that we have coherent, collected information um, that's made available about what that risk is so that banks know what the risk is that's, uh, and supervisors know what the risk is that's being experienced. And, um, it's not the case that cyber issues happen just at a national level, a member state level. Um, there is a very uh, international component to this, and we would be wise to be very coherent about our gathering of that information. Thank you very much. Unless you want to have a seal at the microphone for your last word, it's 2 p.m. So I think uh, I would like to thank both of you. This has been an excellent discussion, and thanks very much. And I also want to thank the audience for being with us and engaging the discussion. Thank you, and I hope we will have you again with us. Thank you.
Thank you very thank you. much. And thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Renzo. Thank you, Elena. Bye-bye.